Okay, well, I think we can get started here. Um, number of attendees is about steady. Um, welcome, everybody, to today's uh, webinar here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about something different. It's still in the series uh, Discovering Open Seas, um, but today we're actually going to talk about hybrid simulation. And specifically, we're, we're going to talk about Open Fresco Express. My name is uh, Andreas Schellenberg. I'm a researcher at the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. And you can see um, Open Fresco Express uh, was funded from uh, different sources, mainly a uh, peer, um, but then it's also based on Open Fresco, uh, which was funded through M NSF, um, MTS, NIS, and uh, NISCOM. So for today's presentation, Go. Um, first of all, I want to give you a little introduction of uh, why we are talking about hybrid simulation today. And first of all, we have the populations of seismically active regions have been growing denser and denser over the years. And so there's greater odds for large scale catastrophes, and we can see that very well from recent earthquakes like the Haiti earthquake in 2010, a very devastating earthquake, and then the Chile earthquake that followed. Shortly after that, also in 2010, we had a, near, a big earthquake in New Zealand in 2011, and then a very, very large earthquake in Japan in 2011, as probably everybody is aware of. So really what we want to do, we want to improve the knowledge and the understanding of the complex nonlinear response and the behavior of new and existing civil structure during seismic events. And because of that, it's really uh, detrimental, uh, very important that the experiment and testing of structures is the cornerstone of earthquake engineering. And that's why we want to talk about experimental testing today and not just about computer simulation. For the outline of today's presentation, we're gonna, I'm going to give you a short introduction to hybrid simulation. Then I'm going to show you how to download and install Open Fresco Express to do hybrid simulations and walk you through an example which shows you how to build your first hybrid model using Open Fresco Express. Then we will talk about simulated versus real controllers and how you can choose between the two. I'll have a sh four short few slides about uh, error monitors showing you how to track uh, the goodness of a test while we do a hybrid simulation. Then I'll give you a second example, which is a two-story building, show you what other resources are out there if you want to do more advanced tests and then give you a summary and conclusions. So for the introduction to hybrid simulation, first of all, we can start off and look at what kind of experimental test methods exist out there. And so we have the quasi-static test method, which can pretty much not capture dynamics. It cannot capture strain rate effects, but it can do large or full-scale tests. Then the second column in the middle, the shaking table test, they can capture the dynamics of a test, um, and they can also capture the strain rate effect. But it's very difficult to do large or full-scale tests unless you have a very, very big table, uh, maybe like in Japan. And so you have some limitations there usually. But then we go for the last column, the hybrid simulation, what we are talking about today. With hybrid simulations, you can capture the dynamics, you can capture strain rate effects if you run your hybrid simulation in real time. And you can do large or full-scale tests if you have the capacities in your laboratory. And you can see at the bottom the first hybrid simulation test, which back then was called an online test, was uh, executed in 1975 by Takanashi et al. So if we look at hybrid simulation, so we have a structure and we feed in an earthquake, and we shake that structure. So that would be a purely numerical structure there. Everything would be simulated in a computer. And if we do that, we have to solve the uh, equations of motion. So we have like uh, the equation that I'm showing up there, where we have to model the inertia forces, we have to model the energy dissipation, and the resistance of the structure. Now, if we do a hybrid simulation, we can come in and replace part of that structure with an experimental test specimen, as you can see that stiffer brace, that chevron brace at the bottom story. So we'll build that in the laboratory and replace that part of our structure 
with the experimental test specimen. So we'll, as you can see, we'll build it in the laboratory. We have to attach some loading frames. We have to attach actuators to that so we can move it around. So then we have the blue parts in the left picture now that are the analytical model of the structure, which is the energy dissipation and inertia forces, as you can see there. And also we have some resisting forces coming from numerical elements. Then for the physical test structure, as you can see the bottom part, um, that one we are just getting resisting forces from the laboratory. And then on the right-hand side of our equations of motion, we have the dynamic loading. And that can be the seismic loading, what we usually use to, but it can very well be also wind loading or blast and impact loading, wave loading or traffic loading. So it can be any kind of loading that we want. Another nice thing when we do a hybrid simulation is that we can put other loading conditions on the structure before we actually run the dynamic loading. So we can put gravity loads on or pre-stress loads on by putting them into the numerical portion of the hybrid model. And so you can see another thing we can do, which is really nice, we can analytically capture like nonlinear non geometric effects uh, by measuring resisting forces and then superimposing those second order effects before we assemble them back into the global system of equations. So when we do a hybrid simulation, what we want to do, we want to model the well understood parts of the structure in a finite element program. And that can be done on one or more computers. And then we want to leave the construction and the testing of the highly nonlinear or the parts that are hard to model numerically that we no don't know so well we want to do those in the laboratories. And again, that can be in one or more laboratories. So when we do this, then you can really consider a hybrid simulation as a conventional finite element analysis where physical models of some portions of the structure are embedded in the numerical model. The components that we require when we do a hybrid simulation are first, a discrete model of the structure that we need to analyze. And that includes static and dynamic loading conditions. And so that's really where Open Fresco Express is going to come in. Then, two, we need the thermohydraulic control system with the static or dynamic actuators, as you can see that highlighted. So you have the controller at the bottom, and you have actuators that attach to your specimen. And then, third, we have the physical test specimen itself. And you need some, in, include some reaction frames so you can attach your actuator to it. And then finally, we have a data acquisition system with some instrumentation, meaning like a load cell, displacement transducer, so we can measure forces and we can measure displacement. So those are the four main components that you require when you do a hybrid simulation. Now we can show you, I'm going to show you what Open Fresco, Open Fresco first is. So Open Fresco is the open source framework for the experimental setup and control. And really, this is secure, object-oriented, network-enabled middleware. So it doesn't do hybrid simulation by itself, but it acts as a middleware, which means it can pair computer analysis software with laboratories, with control systems and data acquisition systems in your laboratory. And so the finite element software or compute, computational drivers that we can pair with OpenFresco, as you can see on the list on the left, are OpenSeas, OpenFresco Express, which we will be talking in more detail in the next few slides. Uh, we can do Abacus, we can use LSDyna or MATLAB, Simulink, ANSYS, or UI SimCore. On the laboratory side, we can talk to many different control and data acquisition systems, as you can see from the second list. We, have, we can talk to DSpace, MTS, several MTS families, like SDS family. We can talk to FlexTest using CSI. We can talk to FlexTest using ScramNet. Uh, we can talk to ScramNet by itself. We can talk to National Instruments Controller, Pacific Instruments, Data Acquisition Systems or Controllers, and ADWIN. So now we can focus more on OpenFresco Express. What is OpenFresco Express? It really is a graphical user interface that is designed to simplify the running of hybrid simulations. So it should make it much easier for the user to set up your hybrid model and then run the hybrid simulation. 
It guides the users through a step-by-step -step process to define the key parameters in a hybrid simulation. And while you run it, you can plot test data, you can plot error monitors all in real time. So you can actually check how well is your test is, how well is your test progressing. And it allows the user to perform hybrid simulations using ground motion inputs, or you can do free vibration tests, a free vibration hybrid simulation. So now I'm going to show you how you can download and install OpenFresco Express. So first of all, you can go to our new website, which is uh, openfresco.berkeley.edu, as it is shown on the top. So you go there, and you go over to the Users tab, come down to OpenFresco Express, and click on that. That will take you to OpenFresco Express page, and the first thing you will have to do before you can download the software, you either have to log in if you already have an account, or you have to register to create a new account. Once you have logged in or registered, you can scroll to the bottom of that same page. That's what it would look like. And you can come along and select what operating system platform you have. So either you have like a 32-bit uh, Windows machine, or you have maybe a 64-bit Windows machine, or you're on a Mac machine. Mac machine, we haven't posted everything yet, but we'll, we'll put that online shortly. So for right now, you can either do Windows 32-bit or um, Windows 64-bit. If you do, for example, click on the Windows 64-bit, uh, it will open up and it will show you the steps you need to follow to install the software. So the first thing you need to do, if you haven't done so already, you need to download and install Tickle TK 8.5. And I highlighted there in red one very important point when you actually click on the download link at the bottom and start installing the software is during the course of that installation, it will ask you where you want to install Tickle TK. And it is very crucial that you install it under C program files backslash Tickle. The default location um, that the installer will give you is a different location. So make sure that when you install the software, you change to that program path that is shown there. Otherwise, you'll run into trouble and you'll probably get some errors when you try to run the software later. Once you have installed uh, Tickle TK, you can then download the next file, which is the MCR installer. So that stands for MATLAB Com Compiler Runtime Libraries. Since OpenFresco Express uh, was all programmed in MATLAB, for you to be able to run the self-executable, you'll have to have some DLLs on your computer so that MATLAB can run correctly. So you don't need to have MATLAB installed, but you need to have the DLLs installed. So that's why you have to download the MCR. Then finally, you download the third file, um, which is OpenFresco Express itself. It's just an exe, an executable, and you can save it anywhere on your computer in a convenient location that you like. So for example, if I do that, I show you, I click on the first link and it will show you that we're going to download the MCR installer. You can maybe place it somewhere like, for example, under C program files, uh, backslash OpenFresco Express, create a folder like that, and download your MCR installer into that folder. Then you can download your OpenFresco Express file into that same folder under C programs OpenFresco Express. Once you have the two files there, you start your MCR installer, which will show up like that. Um, you pretty much just have to follow um, the installer, click through it. Um, it will ask you where you want to install it. The default location for this one is fine. You can just uh, click and go ahead and install MCR. Then once you have MCR installed, you should be ready to start OpenFresco Express. So all you need to do is then click on OpenFresco Express, the executable. If you do that, a DOS window will show up will ask you to be a little patient because especially the first time when you start it up, it will have to internally extract some data. Um, but once that's all extracted, you'll be prompted with a window uh, which shows you the copyright and the disclaimer. And so you can read through this and uh, then accept it. So that will then finally start up uh, the software. And you can see here the software was developed uh, by myself um, by Carl Mitra 
and then with a lot of advice from uh, Professor Steve Mahin. So now I'm going to show you the first example. I'm going to show you how you can build your first hybrid model. To do that, let me see if I can switch over here and bring up OpenFresco Express by itself. And hopefully, you'll be able give me just a moment here. I'll be able to show you this directly live. Okay, so um, can anybody let me know, please, if uh, they can see uh, the main screen of OpenFresco Express now? So we can start with the example. Okay, seems like people can see it. Excellent. Thank you very much. So we can start and setting up our first model here. We're going to do a very simple one degree of freedom model for our first model. And basically, in the main screen of OpenFresco Express on the left, you can see the different buttons like structure loading, experimental setup, experimental control, and then analysis. So what you want to do, you want to start on the top with structure and then kind of start marching down along and start defining the different portions. If you skip ahead, we'll warn you and we'll tell you, hey, you want to set up the loading? Well, please set up the structure first. So we'll start with the structure, one degree of freedom system. And you could switch here by sliding the slider to the right. You can switch to different structures. But for right now, uh, we will start off with this one degree of freedom system. So we have to put in a mass here. So we'll type in a mass. And then the next part, and you can always come over these um, question mark buttons, and that will show you a little tip on what you need to input if you don't know what you have to do. And then we'll put in a stiffness, maybe 2.8 kip per inch. And as soon as we put the stiffness and the mass in, you can see the period will be calculated. So we have a period of about 0 0.53 seconds here. The next thing we want to define is some damping for our structure. So I'm going to, as you can see, when I come on this damping type here, I have two choices for this system. I can either define stiffness proportional damping or mass proportional damping. I'm going to go ahead with mass proportional damping, and I will put in uh, the damping ratio. If you're not sure if this is in percent or just a ratio, you can come over this hover, over this question mark here, and it will tell you that you, for example, for 5% damping, you have to put in a value of 0.05. So I will put in 0 0.02 for 2% damping here. So that's all I need to do, very simple, for our one degree of freedom system. So I'm done with the structure page. So then I can go ahead and come to the next page, which, which is the loading page. It will ask you here um, to put in your different loading conditions. So as you can see, there's two buttons, two tabs, basically. One is for ground motions, and the other one is for free vibrations. For this first example, we'll set up a ground motion as our excitation here. And so what you have to do, you have to click uh, to browse to your ground motion file here. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to come to my example, and I load in a, my ground motion. And that can be, for example, it can understand any ground motion that you can download from the peer ground motion database. Or if you like to look at motions from the Seismic database, you can do that too. It will understand those formats automatically, and you can load those in. So for example, here I have an El Centro ground motion that comes from the peer database, so I can open that up. And immediately as I open that up, if it can understand the format, it will automatically fill in uh, our time step, which is one hundredth of a second and it will fill in uh, amplitude and the time scale factor. So if we want to amplitude this scale, this motion, we can change that factor here. Uh, right now it's just a factor for G. Uh, if we want to scale our ground motion in time, we can also modify that factor. Another nice thing is you can see we have the three plots that show us um, the ground motion history or uh, the um, pseudo acceleration spectra and the displacement spectra. Um, if we want to see a little more information about that, what is really nice, we can click on 
these graphs and it will show up with a bigger window showing us um, the ground acceleration history here. And it will show us what the peak ground acceleration is, peak ground velocity, and peak ground displacement. So I'm going to close that again. I can also come onto the spectra plot, click on that, and that will show up and show me what the response spectra looks like, the SUDA acceleration response spectra. And it will give me a little marker showing me at the period of my structure, remember that was 0 0.53 seconds, it will show me at that period what my pseudo acceleration is. And I'm going to close that, and then I can also show you the last one, which is the displacement spectra. And so for that one, you can see again at our period of our structure, it will show us what the displacement is. So we have about three inches. So if our structure that we are testing uh, or that we're defining here is a linear structure, we would expect it to displace a maximum of about three inches. Once we have the ground motion all set up, we're good. We can keep going ahead and we go to our experimental setup here. Experimental setup just shows you a picture of how that looks like. It's just a column attached, uh, an actuator attached to a column. And really, you don't need to define anything here. So we can keep going. We come to experimental control. And for the experimental control, I want to show you a little more how you can do either a simulated controller or a real controller. You can see we again have two tabs on the top. On the left it says simulation, so that we can define a simulator controller, or we can click on the real controller, one over. So we'll start off with simulated controller. So the drop-down menu only gives you one choice. You have to define what that one degree of freedom of your structure, how you're going to simulate the control for that. So you can click on that, and immediately it will show up there's a few more fields that you need to fill in. First, you will have to choose what type of simulated controller you will have to use. For right now, we have just one, which is using uniaxial materials to simulate the behavior of the control. So I click that, the same uniaxial material controller, and then I have a second drop-down menu at the bottom where I can figure out uh, what material I want to use. And so you can see you can use just an elastic material an elastic, perfectly plastic material, a steel material, which is a bilinear material, or you can use a Menegoto Pinto material, which gives you a more um, kind of nonlinear behavior with more rounded hysteresis loops. So for right now, what we want to do here for our example today, I'm going to do a steel bilinear material. It will automatically fill in uh, the E model. It's basically your stiffness. And you remember, the 2.8 was exactly the stiffness we filled in in the front for our um, specimen. So it will remember that and fill it in for you. And then for the yield strength, we can put in something uh, maybe like 1.5 kips, where our structure is going to start yielding. And then for strain hardening, maybe we'll put something fairly flat, so just like maybe 1% of our initial stiffness, the 2.8 kip ranges for our second slope stiffness. Um, let's see, I, I have, I got a question here from somebody, maybe I can quickly take that in the middle of the uh, presentation here, about how to change units. Um, really, the way Open Fresco Express works, it's all really unitless, so whatever unit you choose, you have to just be consistent. So if you are in SI units, you just make sure that you consistently define everything in SI units, and you should be fine. If you're in imperial units, same thing. Right now I'm working in kips and inches, so I'm consistently defining everything in kips and inches. But if you're in kilonewtons and meters, as long as you define all the parameters everywhere, what you put in consistently in kilonewtons and meters, you should be fine. Okay, so then we can continue. Um, we have everything defined, as you can see, for our um, bilinear material, and so simulation is uh, the controller is defined. Now, if we want to do, instead of a simulator controller, if we want to do a real controller, we can click on that second tab there on top, and you can see there's different types of controllers we can choose. So, for example, we can do a control using LabVIEW, we can use MTS CSI, we can use ScramNet, or we can use DSpace, or we can use XBC target. 
And so we have all these different choices. What I'm going to show you right now is what we would have to do if we do an MTS CSI controller. So if we do that, CSI is a software provided by MTS, so you can talk to your flex test controller. So if you have a flex test controller in your lab, that's what you want to use. Um, what you have to do, there's three parameters we need to define. So if there's a configuration file, which actually comes from the CSI software. And so you can click on your browse button, and you can come and basically go on your computer uh, somewhere, find um, wherever you have a, an, an, a setup, like a, a, a file. Let me see here if I can find it on my machine. For example, here. So I have one stored here. Uh, which we used with OpenFresco uh, using the Micronese laboratory at Berkeley. And so that's a CSI configuration file, so I can load that in. So we'll load that in and fill in the pass automatically for you. And the last parameter you have to define is basically just to put in your ramp time, let's say a tenth of a second. That's all you need to define your real controller. So now I'm going back, and then you would leave that up and continue on if you want to do a real controller. Right now, I'm not connected to the laboratory or anything, so I'm going to switch back to simulation. Using my simulated controller, which I have already defined, I can continue and come to the analysis screen. On my analysis screen, now that's where you set up your hybrid simulation to run. So first thing, very important, as you can see, you have to provide a DT, an analysis time step. And actually, what is nice, it will show you what the stability limit is, because whatever we are doing here with OpenFresco Express, internally we are using an explicit Newmark method to solve the system of equations. And the explicit Newmark method is uh, conditionally stable, so we have to look what that stability limit is, and it will calculate it for you. So for right now, with our parameters that we have put in for our model, you can see stability limit is 0 0.17 seconds. So our DT needs to be smaller than that. Right now we are at one hundredth of a second, so we're good there. Then the next thing we want to do on this page is click on the write tickle file. So this one will basically write all the input files so that OpenFresco later can be run. So that will come up as a little window. We can click that away if it, it tells us if it was successful or not. An optional thing that we can do, we can generate a report with all our input parameters. If I click that, um, you can see the report summary is coming up. It will tell you what the different properties were of your structure. You can scroll down. It will show you what the loading is uh, that you defined, your experimental setup that you're using, the experimental control that you defined, and what your analysis parameters are. So that's useful, and you can print that page if you like. So then, another option we have here, we can animate our structural response if we like to. It will show you a little figure with the model, and it will be animated. For right now, I'll leave that turned off. So then we're pretty much ready to get the test started. So all we really need to do now is um, click on our play button. So let me try that here. So a bunch of windows will come up. Soft window, I can click that down. Don't need to have that there. and Hopefully everybody can see that, but um, I can see the structural output running. I can pause this if I want. I have control buttons on the left. And um, so right now I have it paused at about 20 seconds into uh, the simulation. Um, we can see on the structural output we are showing displacements uh, on the top graph. We can see the forces on the second graph. Uh, we are also seeing accelerations of our structure, and at the very bottom we have our ground acceleration input with a little red marker that's showing us where we are along the ground motion. And then on the very right, we have uh, the hysteresis loop where we're plotting the displacement of our one degree of freedom against the force of that one degree of freedom. And you can see nicely how we have the nonlinear response that we defined because we were using that steel zero one material, the bilinear material with only a 1% um, second slope stiffness, so very flat once it starts yielding. And our yield force was 1.5, so that matches up nicely with our graph. Another plot uh, that we will have here that shows up um, is the error monitors. And so for the error monitors, as you can see, 
because we are simulating everything right now, uh, we don't have any errors showing up. So we have the first graph is really the displacement error. Um, then we also get a Fourier amplitude, so it's doing on the fly an FFT of our displacement error. So it's not showing anything either at the moment. Uh, then on the bottom left corner, uh, we have a stop displacement plot where we plot command displacement against measured displacement. And then on the bottom right, we have uh, the tracking indicator, which basically tracks uh, the area inside the stop displacement plot. And you can see it's all zero right now. And because it is all zero, let me quickly switch over to my presentation here again and show you what that would look like if we actually had connected to a real laboratory with a real specimen, not simulating it, where we're picking up some errors there. And so what happens is it would look more like that. So the displacement error plot, as you can see, would be um, showing some values. So for example, in inches, we would have a displacement error against time. And if we take on the fly FFT of this displacement error, you would see the Fourier amplitude spectrum, which is shown at the bottom. And we could start picking up some frequency in there maybe, which will help us determine if we have making some systematic errors or not. What is nice in Open Fresco Express is if you click on any of these plots, it will come up with a window showing you a little explanation what each plot means. So if you click on the displacement error plot, it will tell you um, what that is actually doing. Same thing, if you click on the Fourier amplitude spectrum, you can, it will show you that and it will say, well, plot the Fourier amplitude of the error, and it can be used to identify the dominant frequency in the error signal, which can be very helpful. The second plot there on the bottom left, um, that's the subspace plot, where we're plotting command displacement against measured displacement. So on the x-axis, we have the command displacement. On y-axis, we plot the measured displacement. If we have perfect tracking, we will get a line that is exactly at 45 degrees. Now, this will show you a lot of information about how your test is doing. So one thing that can happen is, instead of a line, you could start getting an ellipse here. If you have an ellipse that is turning um, around the uh, counterclockwise, you, your system would be um, lagging. If your ellipse is turning um, clockwise around and it's not a line, then your system would have lead in it. Another thing that can happen is that your line, which is now exactly at 45 degrees, could co be coming away from 45 degrees. So it could be at a smaller angle, which would mean that your measured displacement is always smaller than your command displacement, so your system is undershooting. If that line, the angle, gets bigger than 45 degrees, the opposite is happening. Your measured displacement is larger than your command displacement, and you're always overshooting. So this gives you a lot of information about how your test is progressing. Then finally, on the bottom right corner, we have the tracking indicator. The tracking indicator, like I said before, it really plots the area inside the subspace plot. So when we plot the command displacement against the measured displacement, and we start having an ellipse there, we start having an area inside, and we can track that area, and plotting it against time, how that area progresses over time. And so that's basically what you're seeing inside the tracking indicator. Uh, so a positive plot, if your value goes towards a positive value or a tracking indicator, that means you're adding damping into the system. However, if your plot goes towards a negative value, that means um, you're taking out damping, and that can be very dangerous. So if you have like negative damping in your system, your system can become unstable. So it's very important you actually look that uh, up and see how well it's doing while you're testing. Um, then also, if the line is increasing or decreasing, that will show you again if you have lead or lag in your system. So then uh, we can go into the second example. And again, let me go switch over um, to the software here. Give me a moment. Well, maybe we can quickly finish the test here of um, what we were running here. So in just another few seconds, we get to the end of our first example here. So that's that. 
Um, so it tells you the analysis is complete, gives you an option if you uh, want to save your uh, all your results. It will save them into a MATLAB MIT file, so you can retrieve all the information later. But right now, I'm not going to save the information. And then I can click here and run a new test if I want to do that. Um, so let me um, quit this for a moment here and start up the second example. Back up. There we go. So now we can go into the second example. Second example, I'm going to show you how to do a two story building. Uh, two story building is one other option that we have here. If we slide our slider one click to the right, you can see we get a different system. So now we have a system with two degrees of freedom, which can resemble a two-story building. Same thing, we have to first provide the mass and uh, stiffness properties of the different floors. I mean, you can look at the picture. Uh, mass M1 is at the first degree of freedom at the first floor. So um, let's put in like uh, some value here corresponding to a test specimen that we have done at the Berkeley Laboratory. Um, I'm going to make the second mass on the second floor the same value. And then you have to provide the stiffness of the story. So the story stiffness, not the stiffness at the degree of freedom, but the story stiffness. So I'm going to make the first story 1,324 kip per inch. And I'm going to make the second story slightly weaker. Uh, 1,236 kip range. And again, when I have put in all the values, immediately the period and will be calculated. So first period will be at 0 0.4 seconds, and second period is at 0 0.16 seconds. Then. Now we have to, again, if we like to put in some damping, we can do that. Um, again, we can see now there's one more option when we look at the different types of damping that we can specify. We have stiffness proportional damping as before, mass proportional damping as before, but newly we have now also the availability to do Rayleigh damping because we have two modes there. And if we do Rayleigh damping, what, which is what I'm doing right now, we have to put in the two corner points. So let's see, I'm going to put at 1.5% uh, on the first mode and uh, maybe a little more, 3% uh, damping on the second mode. So then I have that all defined. So that's that for the structure. Now we can proceed and go to the loading. Same thing in the loading, same exact story. We can load in our um, file here. Uh, let me browse to the right location. Uh, I can find this. Example. So here I'm loading in uh, a ground motion from the 1994 Northridge earthquake at the Silmar converter station uh, that was recorded there. And again, you can see it understands that format. It loads directly in the time step, which is 5,000 of a uh, second there, and uh, loads in my scale factors. And again, I can change that. If my motion here was like loaded in, in a, if I had a motion that was in SI units, I want to do everything in SI units. Uh, instead of my 386.1 here, I would put in uh, my 9.81 meters per second square. So as long as you're consistent with your unit, that should not be a problem. Again, I can click on the different plots if I want to and look at, uh, the, for example, here at the acceleration, ground acceleration history. Or I can look at the spectra. Now that we have two modes in our system, uh, it will show you, and we have defined two different damping values. For the first mode, we had 1.5% um, damping. Second mode, we had 3% damping. So it will show you two curves now instead of one. And it will show you the two modes of my structure. So it will show me at the first period here, T1, 0 0.4 seconds, what the value is. And at my second period of 0 0.16, when my 
uh, value is there. Same thing if I click on the uh, displacement spectra, it will give me all the values there too. Now I can keep going to the experimental setup. Oh, well, maybe before I do that, let me show you what would happen if you wanted to do a free vibration test, just taking one step back. So if you did a free vibration test instead of a ground motion analysis, you can click on that and um, gives you the option to define uh, what your initial displacement's going to look like. So you can have something which would be according to a first mode displacement or a second mode displacement, or you can have a user-defined displacement um, that you're going to push your structure up. You can see from the plot below, we're going to basically ramp up uh, to a certain initial displacement and then we'll let the structure go on into free vibration. And so right now that's a bit big here. Uh, that will really push our structure into uh, the nonlinear range. So I'm going to make this maybe 10 times smaller here so that we are going to stay in the um, elastic range of our structure. I can put in a ramp time. Maybe I put 10 seconds there. And I could have put a free vibration time, maybe 30 seconds. So that's how you would define a free vibration analysis. Um, maybe we can actually run the free vibration analysis. So, uh, so I'll leave that activated, and I go to the experimental setup. If I come to the experimental setup, um, there's really nothing that we need to do again. You can see now we have two actuators attaching to our specimen, but we don't need to put in any parameters. Um, in the experimental control on the other side, uh, there's a lot of stuff we need to define. So again, we're going to do it the simulation today. We're not going to do a real controller. So I'll stay in simulation. And I have to define, as you can see, the first story and the second story properties when I do that. So if I go to the first story, um, again, I'm going to use a new axial material simulation. It's the only option I have. And I'm going to choose some kind of material here. So let me, for example, use a Menegoto Pinto material. And so the parameters. Uh, are a little different than before when we were using the bilinear model. So I have to put in a yield strength again when our specimen or the first story is going to yield. The stiffness again will be already loaded in from the front. And then I put a strain hardening ratio, maybe 10 per, uh, one, uh, yeah, maybe like 10 percent. That's probably a good value. And uh, some other parameters. If you don't know what these parameters are, you can always come and click uh, on this question mark buttons here, and it will take you actually to the wiki, which will explain you what these different parameters are and what you need to put in there. So now I have my first story defined. I can come to my second story, same thing. I need to define that, again, using sim uniaxial material. Um, go in here. Maybe I'll do again when I got the pinto material, make it the same strength as the first story. Um, putting in maybe just all the same values, make the two stories similar. So now I have everything defined in terms of uh, my simulated control here. Then I can come to the next button on the left, which is the analysis. And same story as before. You can see it will tell me um, what that limit is in terms of uh, my analysis time step that I need to be smaller at. And this one, you can see it changed now. So it's now at 0 0.05, so it dropped because we have two modes in our structure, and the second mode is as a, as a lower uh, higher frequency. So we need to have our dt that is smaller than before. And so for right now, we're using 5 thousandths of a second. And then the next thing, again, write our files, uh, pickle input files, click on that. And we can generate the report. I won't do that right now if we like to. Uh, we can animate the response. Maybe I'll do that this time. And then we are ready to go. So all we need to do this time is click on play again. And I can click the DOS window away. It will load the structure up, push it over to our initial displacement. Once we reach that, it will go into the free vibration. can see structural output, first degree of freedom, what it's doing. We can switch here, come to the second degree of freedom, look at that, what that is doing. We can come over to error monitors and 
see what the error monitors are doing. And you can see there's a tiny, tiny error there, but it's super, super small. So it's basically uh, no error at all. So it already finished our free vibration analysis. So um, again, it asked me if I want to save the results or not. I'm going to skip over that right now. Um, if I did again, it would save them into an MAT file, and I could then uh, come and look at the results later. Um, maybe now what we can do, we can quickly run a ground motion. So we're going to come back to our main window, click on the Run New Test, um, go back to our loading page, switch from our free vibration to our ground motion analysis, come all the way down. We have everything else defined, so I can directly come to Analysis, and then write our tickle files again for the ground motion analysis now. And then we can click play. I'm going to click the DOS window away. And you can see how we're going, starting to do the ground motion analysis. Slide this over here a little bit. You can see how the hysteresis loop now, first story yielding nicely. You can see the hysteresis loop on the right. Um, if we've switched to our second story, that's here you can stay, see it stays linear elastic. So we're kind of getting a little bit of a soft story there. Our first story is going through some pretty significant yielding and second story remains elastic. Okay, so it already finished and again I'm not going to save the results this time. So that was that for the example. So now we can gonna go back to the presentation here. And all this, all the slides uh, are actually available. If you go to the Open Seas, uh, the wiki, and you go to the Discovering Open Seas page, um, the whole presentation is available there to download, and all the slides of the two examples, even though I was showing them to you directly uh, live in the real uh, software, the slides are all there if you want to look at them again. So now I'd like to show you what other resources are out there in case um, you want to do hybrid simulations, maybe with more degrees of freedom, more complicated structures that Open Fresco Express cannot do. There's other resources out there that you can use. The first one would be that you can go to the Open Fresco web page and download Open Fresco instead of Open Fresco Express. And like I showed you at the very beginning, Open Fresco is really the middleware, and you can then use any finite element software that you like, any driver uh, using this, like OpenSeas, for example, or Abacus, LS, Dyna, and so on, to do your hybrid simulation. And then you don't have the limitations anymore um, that you can only do two degrees of freedom, like what you have with Open Fresco Express. So um, that would be one resource. Second resource, if you like to learn more about hybrid simulation, uh, we have a report that is free to download. You can see uh, the address there, and it shows you a lot about the stuff that I was talking about today. It shows you about hybrid simulation in general. It talks about open fresco, and it talks about many other aspects of hybrid simulation. It has some examples in the report. So it's a very good resource um, to have. It will also talk a lot about integration methods and what kind of integration methods you want to use to do hybrid simulation. So those two resources are there. Another nice resource that we have uh, is OpenSeas Navigator, uh, which was developed by Tony Yang and uh, Ichi Kohama and myself. And really, OpenSeas Navigator is a graphical user interface to do um, OpenSeas models. But we have extended this so you can actually also use it to do hybrid tests. So defining the portions of the structure, the experimental portions of the structures, uh, you can do that with OpenSeas Navigator. So you can not only define numerical elements, but you can define experimental elements inside OpenSeas Navigator. And you can define other portions of Open Fresco that are required to do a hybrid simulation. So you can define experimental setups and experimental controls. It has all these inputs there. So that one is also available to download for free uh, from the following web page that is shown right now.
So with that, I'd like to just go into summary and conclusions. Um, I showed you today uh, OpenFresco Express. It's a simplified version of OpenFresco itself, the middleware. And because it's very simplified for right now, we can just do one or two degrees of freedom. Uh, may, we might extend that in the future and maybe add a few more template structures into OpenFresco Express. But for right now, you can do three structures, a one degree of freedom system, a two-story, two degree of freedom building, or a one-story uh, bi-directional two degree of freedom system. Um, it is really easy to use. Uh, you can set up your hybrid model all graphically, uh, as I demonstrated today. You can do ground motion or free vibration hybrid simulations. Um, and you can choose to connect to real laboratory to controllers, actuators and data acquisition systems, or you can simulate the behavior of the test specimens to do dry runs and to learn about hybrid simulations, as I was showing you today uh, for the two examples. Um, you can also watch the progress of the hybrid simulation in real time, uh, looking at the graphs that are being plotted in real time about your structural response, or you have all the error monitors so you can track the accuracy and the goodness of the test as you do your hybrid simulation. And again, for more advanced problems, you can use OpenFresco with the computational driver of any of your choice, like OpenSeas, Abacus, LS Dyna, and so on. And if you like to use a graphical user interface to do more advanced problems, then please try OpenSeas Navigator. And with that, I conclude, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Let me look through if we already have any questions in the meanwhile here. And if you do have new questions, please type them up. One question is if there will be any updates to OpenSeas Navigator this year. Um, yes, I'm working on that, um, probably putting out a new release uh, in the next few weeks. And another question related to that is um, if uh, OpenSeas Navigator will run properly with Tickle TK 8.5. OpenSeas Navigator is really um, kind of independent of OpenSea, so you can use any OpenSeas executable that you would like to use. For example, if you're using the latest OpenSeas executable that is available on the OpenSeas website, then that will run with Tickle uh, 8.5. So that means OpenSeas Navigator should run fine with that too. One other question that I get here is that um, when we define our experimental control in simulation mode, um, that there might be maybe some confusion about stresses and forces, and um, like because we are using materials, and you, usually materials are defined as like a stress strain relationship. But any material that we are using here can as well be used in just displacement force relationship. So really, it does make no difference. You just need to think about it more like a displacement versus force relationship. That's what we're doing when we're simulating the control. So whatever you define in terms of a yield, you want to put a yield force, not a yield stress. And the same thing if you put in a stiffness, you want to put it per force per uh, unit length. And so then that should be all fine. And there should be no confusion really there. Um, another question that I just got is if the presentation is recorded. Um, I did click to record it. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> the software was working fine. I've been using it the first time here today. But I'm sure uh, we'll have a recording of that. And once that's uh, all checked, um, I'm sure we will upload that to the web page as well, as we have been doing that with previous seminars. So yes, uh, a recording will be available. Next question is, uh, if it is possible to run a test under a displacement-specified history with a small mass to really do a quasi-static test. 
Um, currently, we cannot do that with uh, uh, Open Fresco Express. Open Fresco can do that very well, um, but uh, it's a nice thought, and maybe that's something we should consider um, to add into Open Fresco Express that we could use it to do really a quasi-static test. Good idea. Well, we'll wait a few more minutes here just to see if there's any additional questions. Otherwise, we're going to have the second one um, later today, um, 5 o'clock um, <coughs> Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, we'll, we'll have the second presentation. Another new question that just came up um, is uh, if we're going to add a three actuator setup where we have two vertical and one horizontal um, degree of freedom. Um, that was, yeah, like I said before, uh, I'm kind of planning to add a few more uh, very common template structures into OpenFresco Express. And yeah, that, that's one that I have been thinking about. Uh, other one that I've been thinking about is trying to do maybe multiple stories. Like right now we have a two-story, um, basically shear building that we can simulate. Um, another nice thought would be to have just an n-story building that we can do. Or another thought that I had would, for a template that would be hopefully very useful is like a building that has a leaning column. A new question that just came up is if we can model tangent stiffness proportional damping. Um, at the moment, we cannot. Uh, right now, it's using its initial stiffness proportional damping. Um, but yeah, open seas can do that. So if you use open fresco with open seas, you would be able to um, simulate damping that way. But again, a nice thought. I like it. I'll put it on the list of things that we could improve uh, on with open fresco express to add that in. Then finally, we have a question that asking, do we need to write a tickle file for the analysis? Yes, that's when we are on the analysis page. Um, it does it, the, the graphical user interface where you set up all your properties of your structure and your experimental control and everything. It basically does it for you. So when you go to the analysis page, the last page before you run the test and you click on that button to write the tickle files, it does that for you. It takes all your parameters and writes the tickle files for you in the background, so you don't have to do that. A new question that just came up is uh, if we can use Open Fresco Express for a two degree of freedom system where half of the system is simulated analytically and the other half is tested in the laboratory. Right now we cannot do that. So right now, as I said, we have three template structures and for the three template structures, your whole structure will be tested in the laboratory and only your inertia forces and your energy dissipation forces will be simulated numerically. So currently we cannot do that. But if you want to do that, where we're basically doing a substructured hybrid simulation where you have only portion of the model being tested and the other portion being in the analysis, then please go ahead and use uh, open fresco with that one. You can do it. And you can then use, again, your finite element software of your choice. So you, for example, you can use open seas to do that.
And then one question is how about 3D analysis, if there's any software out there to do that. Um, I didn't show that example today. We have one uh, template structure in OpenFresco Express to do a 3D analysis. So where you have uh, one cantilever column um, loaded in two directions. Um, if you want to go to more complicated things, again, you can do it with OpenFresco. OpenFresco can do any 3D, any 3D structure. Like I said, OpenFresco Express is really a very simple tool here. It does only very few structures, but it makes it very easy to use. And if you want to do more complicated stuff, you have to go and use OpenFresco with your finite element software of your choice. Then I have a question here asking if I can say something about collapse testing uh, in the context of hybrid simulation. Uh, very good question. Um, we can do, like if we use OpenFresco, uh, not OpenFresco Express, but if we use OpenFresco, we can do collapse testing. And we have demonstrated that. And there's a paper out um, that we had in the 14th World Conference, if you try to look that up, which will talk about how to do collapse testing using hybrid simulation. And like I was showing in the beginning when I gave you the quick overview of hybrid simulation, one thing that is nice about hybrid simulation is that when you measure forces from your experimental specimen, you can then actually, in your analytical model, superimpose or kind of add on your uh, P-delta effects. So you can add in second order effects after you measure um, in in the lab your resisting forces and so you can capture those things uh, in our in your hybrid model and through that you can then simulate um, structural collapse um, there's several levels of how you can do that um, if you you either just capture global p delta effects in your hybrid model or if you want to start capturing like local p delta effects uh, like what they call the small p delta effect or uh, local buckling effects, then that would mean you would also have to load your specimen in your laboratory with the axial load, uh, with the correct axial load. And that becomes a little bit more involved because then you will have to have axial degrees of freedom that you're controlling, which oftentimes become pretty stiff. And so um, it can be done, uh, but it will be a little tricky. One question that I get here is if the analysis is performed fast enough so that it is actually in real time, and if that can be done, and if that's the case, if then damping, damping can be modeled or captured directly in the experiment. Yes, good question. Um, for, depends really, if you, well, let's start with OpenFresco Express about being able to do an experiment in real time. If you have a fast enough computer, you should be able to use OpenFresco uh, to do it in real time, uh, as long as your controller and everything um, can do that correctly. Um, it really depends, but uh, with, with my current machine, um, I, it runs fast enough so that I've tried that I can run OpenFresco Express to do actually a real time test. Uh, with my old machine, that was not the case, but with the new one, that works. So it, it depends a lot on your hardware, too. Um, but theoretically, it, it should be working. Um, and if you do that, um, the question then is, yeah, can you just capture directly uh, damping in your specimen? Um, yeah, because we are modeling here the whole uh, structure uh, that would be yeah valid, that we would basically capture that. And um, But if we did make... A, do a substructure test instead of a complete test where we model the whole specimen in the lab, then we would still have to define some kind of damping for the analytical portions of the structure. All right, I think we had a lot of questions here. Good attendance. Um, again, 
uh, we'll have the second seminar um, later today, uh, 5 o'clock Pacific Daylight Saving Time. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot to, for everybody uh, who was participating, and thanks for all the really informative and good questions that we were getting here today.